history of your ancestors. Thank you very much. Well, uh, good morning, everybody. I'm delighted to see so many people here. And thank you very much, John, for a fascinating talk. And more by good luck than good management, we don't overlap too much. I think. <laughs> so uh, so that, that's a good start. Well done, that's well done. <laughs> I, I, too, am an engineer, although I have to say I'm actually an electrical engineer rather than a, a mechanical engineer. But I've worked on all sorts of things, from steam turbines to transformers to being on the board of Rolls Royce, and so I've had a wide exposure to um, mechanical engineering as well as electrical engineering. And I'm proud to say that Henry Maudsley was my great-great-grandfather, so the engineering tradition continues. Now, if we um, look, oh, we have a minor other problem, never mind, no, sorry. Um, we shall go, we shall go there, so on that one. Right. Um, they, I personally always use Apple and never have these problems, so <laughs> I have no truck with Microsoft whatsoever. Okay. Talking about the family background, um, the Maudsley family also originated in Yorkshire, but a bit far, further away, the Clapham, Settle, Long Preston district, and the family tree traces the family back there to the <coughs> mid-1500s. And then uh, Henry Maudsley's father, uh, apparently because of some um, trouble about um, some paternity suit to do with an illegitimate child, nobody quite knows the story, but anyhow he left Yorkshire, whether he walked or not, I'm not sure, but he got as far as Norwich, and then he enlisted in the Royal Artillery, and he was sent out to fight in the West Indies, and he was injured there with a musket ball in the neck. And so when he came back, he was given a job at the Woolwich Arsenal as a, as a storekeeper. And the Woolwich Arsenal in those days was a very interesting place because it was actually a hub for heavy engineering in London. There were other heavy engineering works making steam engines elsewhere in the UK, but in the London area, probably the Woolwich Arsenal was <coughs> the place for heavy engineering. Uh, Henry's son was the fifth child. It appears that none of the other children went into engineering. One of them became a wheelwright and was involved in, in making carriages. And there's a lovely note on an old family tree that I've got, uh, which said that the youngest child, uh, Henry's sister, kept a very, very celebrated ladies' college in Putney and died single, but I know nothing more about her. Um, Henry's youth. Uh, he started off, I mean, he would have had a very rudimentary education, um, one assumes, um, working uh, with his father working in the, uh, in, in the arsenal. He started as a powder monkey, um, must have been rather heavy and dirty and pretty miserable job actually filling cartridges with powder day after day. He then managed to get himself into the carpenter's shop. And then he moved on, and different accounts call it different things, whether it's the forge or the smithy or the foundry or whatever, but he would have started to work with metal. Uh, and he had the experience of working with wood and then moved into working with metal, which is rather similar to what John was saying uh, about Brahma. And the combination of the two techniques is quite interesting. In fact, when you look at a lot of the early steam engines, you can see the metal joints are actually very similar to the sort of joints that a woodworker would have used years before. Um, one of the things that he would have learned, because he would have learned casting, forging, all sorts of things in the smithy, but he would also, um, one assumes, have learned about heat treatment, which was something that must have become very important to him, because he would have wanted hardened metal for a lot of the things he was doing later on. So he was plucked out by Brahma, aged 18, and I won't go into more detail about that because John has covered it so eloquently. He became Brahma's foreman, and one thing John didn't mention, he just said that he went. Well, the reason why he went was um, after he'd been there for seven years, eight years, um, he had married Brahma's housekeeper, Sarah Tyndall, and they'd had children, and he had the temerity to ask for a pay rise because he was being paid 30 shillings a week. And Brahma was so appalled at the idea that um, uh, his foreman wanted a pay rise that he said no, and so Maudsley left. And the story is that 
Um, he left on the Friday and started his own works on the Monday. And uh, as John alluded to, one thinks there might have been a little bit of pre-planning that came into that. <laughs> but anyhow, he was aged 26 when, um, uh, when he set up his own business. And this is another view um, which, which shows the Brahma lock uh, in a slightly different way to the, the, the pictures that John showed you. And this shows you one with multiple slots in. I mean, whether actually any of them were made with this many slots, um, I rather doubt it, actually. I think this may just have been uh, a sort of schematic drawing to sort of show the sort of thing that we can do. And these are the machines, um, two of the machines, that uh, Henry Maudsley developed so that Brahma's locks could be made in quantity, uh, efficiently to the right cost. Uh, the one on the left is the um, spring making machine because as John explained you need all of these springs and so they, they have to be wound. And the one on the right is the slotting machine and this, this slotting machine which is um, still visible in the, in the Science Museum uh, could cut four, five, six, seven, eight, ten or twelve slots. So it was a very versatile machine. Um, and it could also slot a barrel up to one and three quarter inches diameter and from two to eight inches long. I mean, who actually used a key that was up to eight inches long? I have a feeling that this was another, we can do it so we'll tell the world we can do it, but I doubt very many of them were actually made. It's probable that um, Maudsley actually started thinking about his ideas on machine tools such as lathes when he was making these for Brahma. I too have an example of a, a, a Brahma lock here, um, which is something that has come down through the family, and it's a dispatch box. Do have a look at it. It's got a Brahma lock, but the whole box is actually made by Brahma because there's a plate on the inside saying Brahma 124 Piccadilly. So it's a rather nice souvenir. So if we then move on and we, we start thinking about what was engineering like, it wouldn't have been called engineering at the time, but what was mechanics like in London in the late 1700s? Well, for 200 years, more than 200 years, London had really been the center of scientific instrument making. And a lot of these were very precise, but most of them were actually one-offs or, or small runs. And, they were used by clockmakers, um, uh, they were used in astronomy, and after the um, 1745 rebellion in, in Scotland, when the Ordnance Survey was formed, uh, there was great interest in map making, and so more and more surveying instruments would have been produced. And again, these, these were small, small-scale one-offs. And if you're interested in these early scientific and um, astronomical clock-making machines, there's a splendid new gallery in the Science Museum in London, which is called London Science City. And that shows the whole history from 1650 to 1800. And there's a very good <coughs> book that, that goes with it, which I thoroughly recommend to you if you're interested in that. So, um, the Royal Arsenal in Woolwich, as, as we mentioned, um, was a hub for heavy engineering and they had some very interesting large machines um, for boring cannon balls uh, and, and things like that. But the interesting thing about these machines, and I'll show you a picture of one in a moment, is that although they had metal parts for the actual working of the machinery, the rest, oh dear, what have we got here? <laughs> but you can upgrade for free if you really want to. Um, but the, the, the interesting thing was that the framework of these big machines were actually made of wood. Um, and you'll see that is um, a, a, a typical um, surveying instrument from the late 1700s considerable precision. Um, but here you see, um, and it's probably not very easy to see from the back, this is a, a, an old woodcut. Um, but this is in the Royal Arsenal at Woolwich, and this is people actually boring a cannon. And you can see here these massive wooden blocks. So it was a fairly advanced machine tool, but it was by no means just a metal machine tool. But we're here to talk about precision. 
and I've given some thought to what it is really that um, is necessary before you can have precision in engineering. And I've come up with these five preconditions. Uh, the first one is you've got to have the right materials. Materials to make the item and materials to make the machines to make the item. The second one is you need perfectly flat surfaces so things make together properly. Thirdly, you need accurate screw threads um, and the screw threads are not necessary only for making nuts and bolts to hold the bits together but actually for making the machine tools to make the bits. Fourthly, uh, as was touched upon in, in one of the questions, you need to be able to measure what you've made. And finally, once you've got all this machinery in a workshop, you actually need something to drive it. So I'll analyze each of these uh, preconditions in a bit more detail. Materials, pre around 1800, uh, as I said, you know, the working parts of the machine tools were metal, but the frameworks were wood. Um, and you needed better metals, so there were, by the mid, seven, mid to late 1700s there were a lot of advances in steel making uh, here in Sheffield where there was good quality crucible steel being produced and that would have had to find its way to London whether it was sent by sea or how it was sent down I'm not sure, maybe there's people in this room who know a lot more about that than me but one of the interesting things is that it was said that Henry Maudsley's wish to move from the carpenter's shop into the smithy was because he realized you could get greater accuracy working with metal. And this thing about materials is, is fascinating. In, in many of the different places where I've worked in, in my career, significant advances have actually come from materials. In power transformers, uh, better silicon iron from the core, for the cores, helped us um, move on. Uh, in switchgear, power switchgear, using sulfur hexafluoride SF6 uh, as an insulant enabled us to make um, much more compact high voltage switchgear. In aero engines, the fact that we could make single crystal um, uh, blades was a huge advance. And um, after I um, left Rolls-Royce, one of the companies I got involved in was Hardy Fishing Tackle. And we were able to work with 3M to get some nanoparticles that we could put in the resin so you could actually get a carbon fiber fishing rod that was so flexible that the tip could actually come and meet the butt without it breaking. So all of those things came from advances in materials. Now moving on, truly flat surfaces. Um, traditionally surfaces have been produced by, by filing, as John said. And for those of you who actually had to do it as part of your apprenticeship, it ain't easy. Um, it is very easy to do badly, it's very difficult to do well. Uh, it was said of Henry by um, one of his employees, it was a pleasure to see him handle a tool of any sort, but he was quite splendid with an 18-inch file. And that, that's a very interesting reflection on the sort of things that he would have been doing. And he would have been uh, filing surfaces flat and then rubbing the two surfaces together, putting a bit of uh, what we would now call engineer's glue between them to see whether they were flat or not, <coughs> then filing again to get rid of the high spots. But of course, if you have two surfaces, you can cover them with engineering glue, rub them together and convince yourself that they are absolutely flat. But if one is concave and one is convex, they will still appear to be perfectly flat. <laughs> What he did was say, we need three surfaces, and you've got to mate each one to every other one using engineer's blue, rub them together, see whether there are any high spots. And if you're doing that with three, you can get perfectly flat surfaces. And in fact, to get the final flatness, instead of filing it, he would have used a scraper uh, and to get even greater precision. So he managed to get these flat surfaces, and he gave them to each of his key employees and said, there you are, keep that on your bench. That is your test bed, so you can test whether your flat surface is really flat. Then the next one was accurate, repeatable screw threads. Now the problem always is, is getting the first screw thread. Once you've got the first one and it's accurate, you can then move on from there. Um, Henry Maudsley used an inclined knife into soft metal, and I'll show you a picture later of the machine he developed to do that but he managed to cut these accurate screw threads 
And then when he got those, he was able to put them into uh, his screw cutting lathe and make better screw threads and go on and on from there. And there is, as John alluded to, quite a bit of discussion about um, who invented the uh, screw cutting lathe. Um, and there's a lot of books that have been written about uh, this. Um, Rolt in his book mentions it in considerable detail. The conclusion is that although many people contributed, Henry Maudsley undoubtedly perfected the screw cutting lathe as we know it in, in its present form. Um, once you've got your screw cutting lathe and you can make good quality screws, then you can use those in other machines. You can use them in milling machines, you can use them in slotting machines, all sorts of things, but you need your accurate screw thread first. Um, the five foot screw, which is um, mentioned here, was um, a, an extraordinary thing. I mean, to make a screw five foot long, two inch diameter, um, uh, 50 threads per inch, and make that match with a 12 inch long uh, nut that actually went the whole way up and down this five foot. That, that is a tremendous achievement, and you were making the point about accuracy. Um, I mean, my toolmaker's vice that I made during my uh, apprenticeship um, still has a, a thread rattling about, and that was made on modern machine tools, but never mind. Um, accurate measure de measuring devices, I mean, Making all of these bits and getting them flat is one thing, but then you need the dimensional accuracy. You need to be able to measure it every time. And using his accurate screw threads and using the principle of the micrometer, Henry Maudsley made this measuring device, um, uh, which he or one of his workers called the Lord Chancellor because it was the ultimate arbiter of disputes. <coughs> and this would have been used, his workers would have come to him saying, can you check that please, I think it's the right length. It would have been checked and uh, he was able to say yes it's right or it's not and this measured um, as you alluded to to an accuracy of one tenth of one thousandth of an inch something that um, even 10 years before let alone 25 years before would have been absolutely unthinkable so you've got all of these nice machines in this workshop um, and they would all have been belt driven but you needed something to drive those belts and uh, originally workshops would have used water wheels, water power, that was unreliable. Then um, you could start using one of the new beam engines that were available. But beam engines are very heavy and there's a big thump every time they come down. And you could find build good foundations in somewhere like Cornwall because you had very solid rock. But actually on the clay soils of London, it was remarkably difficult to build stable foundations for your steam engine to drive all the stuff in your factory. So Henry Maudsley uh, designed what he called a, a table engine, which had a flat base, and I'll show you a picture just in a moment, uh, and you can see how this was much better suited to driving the machinery in a factory. But. Um, the Maudsley Company did make beam steam engines, and there's this one in the London Water, no, London Museum of Water and Steam, as it now calls itself, what I still call the Kew Bridge Steam Museum. And Jonathan and I, and one or two <coughs> other people in the audience, uh, were at uh, an event recently um, where that was actually taken out of service for the last time because it was being used until the 1950s. It's been uh, fired up and worked um, for the benefit of visitors uh, regularly since then, but it's, it's beginning to show its age, and so the museum took the difficult decision to actually take it out of service and preserve it, but preserve it in such a way that if future generations do want to fire it up again, it should be possible. Uh, that is an example of the table engine. Uh, that's one that's actually in the Science Museum. And you can see totally metal framed, um, but a very elegant uh, machine tool. And that's the sort of thing that um, he would have used for driving the machines in his factory. So once you've satisfied those five preconditions um, uh, that, that I've laid out, what could Henry Maudsley actually do? Um, and the first thing, of course, that he hadn't satisfied all of those preconditions, but he was working towards them 
when he was making the machinery to enable Brahma to make the lock. So the thinking process started at that stage. Then um, the next thing was making uh, Brunel's block making machinery. Um, and I'll talk about that in more detail later. But the really important thing it was that he was then able to make more machine tools for his own factory. There were lathes, there were all sorts of other machine tools, which enabled him to offer a service um, as general engineers, as they called themselves originally, making all sorts of different machinery with sufficient precision. It's interesting that um, the Maudsley Company never actually sold machine tools uh, except small treble lathes. Quite why they never made um, larger lathes for sale to others is, is something that's a bit of a mystery. It may be because he was trying to restrict competition. I don't think anybody knows. Um, some pictures of the different machines. This is the machine for originating screw threads and it's probably rather difficult to see from the back but you can see these, uh, these cuts in the soft metal, which are the initial cuts for um, developing the, the screw thread. And then you go on to this small screw cutting lathe, um, which is a real masterpiece in precision. And just imagine the joy for people working in engineering companies, um, suddenly to have multiple screws that were all the same. So you could actually pick any nut out of a box and any screw out of a box and it fitted. Because before that you would have been in a situation where you had to mate every one to every one. And the, the difficulties, the problems, uh, the time involved, um, this must have been a real revolution. Mind you, I, there are times I'm in the middle of restoring a 40-year-old Range Rover and uh, dear Leyland ended up with the most marvellous mixture of uh, UNC, UNF and metric. Um, and I try to find the right nut to go on the right bolt and find myself scrabbling around in the box trying to get the right one. Um, there is a, a picture of the lathe. This is uh, a lathe that is in the Science Museum. Um, you can see the very precise lead screw on there. Um, and this was the real uh, fundamental thing to get uh, precision. Um, that is the Lord Chancellor for measuring between these two points using um, uh, this micrometer arrangement at the end. And just to give you an idea of the, the scale of those two, there's the lathe behind and the, um, the Lord Chancellor in front. And not only did this precision help with interchangeability of parts um, for maintenance, but it also helped with speeding up manufacture. And this is quite an interesting uh, extract from an 1812 <coughs> advertisement for Maudsley's company. For those of you who are at the back who may find it difficult to read, I'll just read it out. Henry Maudsley and Company Engineers, London, beg leave respectfully to acquaint gentlemen, merchants, manufacturers and their agents that they're enabled by their extensive manufactory and machinery at Lambeth to furnish, upon reasonable terms, the most approved and complete steam engines, and when to send abroad, provided with all necessary duplicates, etc., of the wearing parts, to ensure their perfect success in countries where mechanical assistance cannot easily be procured. <coughs> so, they were sending out spares, and the interchangeability of nuts and bolts would greatly have helped the sort of thing that they were trying to do. Now, I mentioned the block making, and uh, when Mark Brunel uh, was, uh, came up with this idea of making um, blocks for the Navy in a better method that had been used before, and blocks were needed in huge quantities, I mean, over 100,000 a year, and there was, uh, as there always has been, and perhaps there always will be, there were great suspicions about the French. And what were the French going to do? Were they going to invade? And so the Navy wanted to not only build new vessels, but also refurbish its old vessels. And each of these vessels had a very large number of um, pulley blocks on them. And they employed a team of well over 100 people who were quite convinced that they had the most efficient method of doing it and nobody could do it any better. And it was very much a craftsman-based exercise. Brunel had this idea, and he plucked Maudsley out, probably having seen that screw in the window, 
um, rather in the same way that Brahma plucked Maudsley out of the Woolwich Arsenal. And he said, you're the guy who can help me um, turn my concept of these machines into something that will actually work. And the production line, and it's really the first production line ever, long before Henry Ford started making a production line, this was a production line of 43 or 44 machines that took trees in at one end and had the finished components for blocks coming out the other end. And by the time it was all finished, and these were all metal construction, um, only 10 people were needed. Uh, I mean, it's an interesting reflection on what happened to the other 90 or so um, who, who were out of work. They can't have been very happy with this. But this is the way engineering and scientific progress has led us. So the components, and most of you will probably be aware of this, the components that go into a block, you've got the pin in the middle, um, you've got the pulley assembly, and you've got the, the outside of the block, and here it is um, fully assembled. Um, this is one of the machines. This is the mortising machine. Um, Jonathan and I have been talking about um, uh, how we can persuade the powers that be um, in the dockyard to actually open this up. Uh, there's a problem because the building um, that this was, uh, all this equipment was located in is next to a secure area and the Navy are a bit worried about letting people into the building because they might look out of the window and see something they shouldn't see. But We'll, we'll work on it and see what we can do, because it would, it's very <coughs> unlikely we could get all 43 machines together, but it would be fantastic if we could just get a selection of them and show this um, marvelous example of production line manufacturer to great accuracy. Um, that, this is a photo from the 1950s showing one of the machines still in operation over 100 years after they were installed, and it's interesting to see that they're using one of their own block and tackle arrangements to load the timber onto this. Um, the company went on to, um, both before Henry Maudsley's death and, and after his death, um, to make a very wide range of, of machines. And this, I think, was uh, so common with engineering companies of this time. Uh, I mean, as we've seen with Brahma, you know, there were many different lines of production. Uh, steam engines became incredibly important, especially marine steam engines, and um, his, one of his sons, Joseph, really took the marine steam engine manufacture forward very successfully. Rope making machines, because with all of these blocks you need very good ropes and uh, the, the one at Chatham um, is, is still uh, available for people to go and see. Sawmill machinery, uh, he must have been quite pleased that he was able to sell some sawing machinery to uh, the arsenal. Um, having grown up there as an apprenticeship, actually to sell them a machine tool must have given him a great sense of pride. Coin minting machinery, not just for the UK, uh, but that was exported as well. Some of it went to uh, the Royal Mint in Turkey. Calico printing machinery and, and time balls. I'll talk a bit about time balls in a moment. But all of these machines needed precision uh, in their manufacture. Some of them were more precise, some less precise in their operation, but without precise machine tools, you wouldn't have been able to make this range of machinery. We talked about the Lambert Works. Um, that, that's where it is, um, or where it was. And there's actually a plaque. If you go down the steps into Lambeth North Tube Station, there is a, a blue plaque which says this was the site of Maudsley Sons and Field, uh, near St. Thomas's Hospital. Um, that's a view of the Chatham rope work, um, long, long sheds for producing these um, very, very long but very strong, well-made ropes. The time balls, um, these were an interesting uh, development uh, which the company got into after Henry Maudsley's death. Um, Mariners, as I'm sure you know, uh, they, they needed to set their chronometers. So when they were in port, they needed to uh, know exactly when a certain time of day was so they could set their chronometer so they could then work out their longitude on a voyage. Um, and the balls were erected in various places around the UK and indeed around the world. 
and they uh, were visible from the harbour. Um, the uh, ship's master would have had his telescope trained on this. At 10 to 1, the ball went up to quite near the top. At 5 to 1, it went right up to the top. And at 1 o'clock, precisely, it dropped down. This is the time ball at Deal, where there's a nice museum. This is the famous one in Greenwich, which is dropped at 1 o'clock every day. And this is the mechanism of the one in Edinburgh. Um, and you can see the precision gear cutting there. Um, and it, it's, it all comes back to having the right machine tools to make the right gears, the rack and pinion gears, so that something like this can work precisely day after day after day. The, the company exported quite a lot of time balls, um, Australia, New Zealand, Cape of Good Hope. There was a lovely one which had been uh, very nicely restored in Christchurch, which was sadly lost in the earthquake. Um, and uh, it's probably going to be too expensive ever to rebuild it. And just a final example of some of the products they made. Uh, this was very late in the history of the company because the company actually went into administration in the early, very early 1900s. But this is the great wheel at Earl's Court that was constructed in 1895. And they, they made parts for great wheels for other places as well. Um, including Blackpool, Vienna, and Paris. Um, so the idea of the London Eye is really just a repeat of something that had been done for years. Um, this business about spreading the word on precision uh, appears to have been very important for Brahma, and particularly for Maudsley. And there's a whole list of people who came in as apprentices or partners or, or whatever into his company and then went on to found their own businesses, invent things, and this is just a, a, a list of a few of them. Um, Isambard Kingdom Brunel is probably the most famous name on the list, um, but Richard Roberts was uh, incredibly important in terms of going on to make sophisticated lathes, and um, Naismith is another name you will know well. And there were other names of people who uh, worked in the company and stayed in the company. Um, Field and Sells. Field became a partner and the company became called Maudsley, Sons and Field. And so these people continued this, tra this tradition of precision um, for generations <coughs> to come. This is the, the famous etching um, uh, of innovative scientists and engineers. It's actually called Distinguished Men of Science, living in the years 1807 to 08. Um, and there is a small reproduction in the exhibition that you'll see downstairs. And there's a fascinating book um, that goes with it, that has a, a mini biography of each of the people. Um, Henry Maudsley is, uh, is standing here, uh, for some reason, when they were trying to assemble all the um, pictures, because they probably got individual etchings of people and, and put them all together to make this, they were unable to find anything of Brahma, and so Brahma's the one with his back to the camera. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, never mind. Uh, at least he got onto it. One thing that would be really interesting, and I, I thought about when I was preparing this presentation, is to go through all of the people who are on there. Um, you know, some are more science, what we would call scientists rather than engineers, but to look at the people who were involved in engineering and ask how much of their work really relied on precision. And it, it would be a fascinating task. And I think you would find that there was a huge amount of, of commonality in terms of seeking precision in the sort of things they were doing. I mean, the people who were working in textile machinery, for example, all needed that degree of precision. Henry Maudsley has probably received rather less publicity in, in recent years than many of the other people. I mean, Brunel always comes out as the, the, the number one, if you ask, what famous engineers do you know about? But he did appear, along with his table engine, as part of this, uh, these stamps that were produced about 10 years ago on pioneers of the Industrial Revolution. 
it's, it's interesting to um, look at two sayings that um, are attributed to Henry Maudsley. I mean, the first one, get a clear notion of what you plan to accomplish, and then in all probability you will succeed in doing it. And I think many of us could apply that um, to many parts of our lives. But the next bit um, could be used by uh, somebody who was a consultant peddling um, the answer uh, value engineering as the answer to everybody's problems. It would say, keep a sharp lookout upon your materials, get rid of every pound of material you can do without, put to yourself the question, what business has it to be there, avoid complexities and make everything as simple as possible. And I will put it to you that simplicity is actually a bedfellow of precision. Now before I finish, um, I should say something about the, the Maudsley Society because the company went into liquidation in the early 1900s, but its memory lives on. And there were quite a lot of people working in the company, either as apprentices or, or as craftsmen or whatever, in, uh, when it went into administration, who by the time they got to retiring age in the 1940s, said to themselves, Actually, we ought to commemorate the great training that we received in that company. So they formed something called um, Men of Maudsley's, uh, was the original name. And they put some money together, which was used for scholarships for boys to stay on at school and study technical subjects. Then the government started providing for people to stay on at school, provided the funding for that. So the um, Maudsley Society, as it became known, the Maudsley Society money started to be used for funding undergraduates. Then the government took that on in those halcyon days that many of us can remember. And so the money is now used um, for a postgraduate fellowship at Cambridge uh, with Pembroke College. And uh, it goes on year after year. We, um, we have the original endowment. We've been able to raise more money since then. And it's very interesting to see the sort of engineering uh, that, that the Maudsley Fellows are actually working on. A lot of it recently has actually been in nanotechnology, although there was one fellow a, a few years ago who was working on advanced work for aero engine turbine blades. And uh, an, an interesting bit of memorabilia um, is that the president of the Maudsley Society has this gavel to bring the meeting to order, and the head of the gavel is actually a block which was made on the Maudsley block making uh, machine. So I'll leave that here for you to look at later. Now, um, 2021 um, uh, is going to be the 250th anniversary of Henry Maudsley's birth. And uh, those of us in the Maudsley Society have been talking with the Newcomen Society to say, how are we going to commemorate this? And we're planning in September 2021 to have an event at the Kew Bridge Steam Museum, the London Museum of Steam and Water, uh, to celebrate not only Henry Maudsley's life, but the legacy um, and a, what has actually been done by succeeding generations. So keep an eye on the Newcomen paperwork and you'll get details of that. To finish off, I'll, I'll just quote you something from Naismith, uh, who worked closely with Henry Maudsley before setting up his own business. And he said, Henry Maudsley's life was enthusiastically devoted to the grand object of improving our means of producing perfect workmanship and machinery. That is a perfect epitaph to precision. Thank you very much. I was brought up in Lincolnshire and we had one of the last of these blacksmiths. 
And I remember I used to go in there um, and help my father open a specialist welder during the war. So I was one of the few who was allowed in uh, as, as boys. But his main work was repairing farm machinery. And I remember that he used to basically, when he had to make a piece, of, uh, a piece for the machinery, he would take a piece of lead bar and basically shape it to the piece by hand. Then about 40, well, about 20 years later, I read Moore's list autobiography, 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 and there was this wonderful thing in there about Maudsley was wonderful in basically shaping things in a piece of lead before he did it, but he was described as being even better when he came to work with the metal. Yes. Yes, apparently he used to keep um, lead bars in his office um, to actually uh, form the, the, the initial ideas. Yeah. But, yeah. So basically, Village Blacksmith in Lincolnshire was using a very similar concept in, in the 1950s. <coughs> With that, questions please. Frank. Thank you Richard. Can you, can you say something a bit more about calico printing? Because I'm getting quite interested in somebody called James Thompson of Clitheroe, who was heavily in calico printing in the mid-19th century. And I'm just wondering what the technical advances that Morsley made that allowed calico printing to take off in the early 19th century. <laughs> I, I wish I could answer the question. Uh, I, all I've ever seen is just a reference to calico printing machinery, and I've never seen any more. I don't know whether any examples exist anywhere. Okay, well, can we investigate? <laughs> <laughs> John, I think it's very interesting when you said that Morrissey never went into machine tools commercially, because in that very interesting list that you showed, was they all except for one, this little bit of Kingdom Bunnell, went into machine tools yes. and were highly successful. And not only that, a lot of them, subsequent <coughs> to Maudsley, went to Holtzap from across the river, yes. uh, which was the big, the big competitor. Yes. Uh, I found that extremely interesting. Far better to have concentrated on marine engines and steam engines. And what I do have, uh, and I've had it in my collection, uh, for some time is a very interesting brochure that was prepared in the 1940s. Henry Maudsley, Maudsley Sons and Fields, and it's a commemorative volume <coughs> prepared to form the board. What do you got? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because yes. I was going to say, if I had a volume, yes. I would have been very pleased to have sent it. Um, this, um, this was prepared, um, uh, it, it, well it was a memoir prepared for private circulation by Cyril Maudsley, yeah. um, who was my um, godfather, um, mm -hmm. and then there's an address in it by uh, somebody called Sir Francis Carnegie, uh, who was the chief superintendent of Woolwich Arsenal, and it was an address he gave at a centenary service at the parish church of St. Mary Woolwich um, in uh, February 1931 uh, to uh, commemorate the 100th anniversary of Henry Maudsley's death. But it is a fascinating little book. Isn't it? it? But yeah. what's interesting is the list of marine engines yes. they made. There is a, which I found a very useful reference book. There is, um, I've, I've got a, a sort of large sheet of all of the um, marine engines that they made, and a lot went to the Russian Navy. They did, um, yes. A lot went to um, various people's steam yachts. There was a royal yeah, yacht, yeah. or if not two royal yachts. Um, and uh, there's, it's a fascinating list. Mr. Um, this is just a quick question. Are there any papers yeah. that would reveal what was actually in all the Sun and Fields machine shops in the terms of machine tools? Uh, what, what, when, it, when it finished? At any time? Um, no, I, I, it, there are some papers in um, the Science Museum archives showing what they rescued at the time it went into liquidation. But there is very little. I think a lot of the paperwork actually disappeared at that point. You know, the Science Museum took some, um, but an awful lot must have been destroyed. Could I just now, make a point? I'm going to take this David first, and I'll come to that David. <laughs> yeah, uh, yes, um, I do appreciate the reference to importance of materials. And I'd just like to make a suggestion for your uh, celebration next year. Um, I 
visited the Kakoli Testing Works, which was the large scale testing facility for civil engineers. And I think that forms part of the continuing legacy. And there's a link between the testing works and my own experience of hydraulic machines, which is in tensile testing. Mm. And I think uh, that's a very precise application of hydraulics for the largest machines. And I think it would be quite interesting for somebody to look into perhaps the development on top of the precision manufacturing to the precision testing of materials properties. Uh, I just offer that as a suggestion. Yes, uh, thank you for that. Yes. David. Well, first of all, an answer to that question is Caius in London, we're involved, our headquarters is in fact the Cockyoldy Testing Works, and there are quite a number of publications, including some new new ones that have just been uh, written on Cockyoldy's Testing Works. Right. Well, I thought it was an interesting link. Yeah, but uh, uh, just to say, previous question, there are in fact about five or six photographs of the Morsley Works in 1863, 62, 63, taken by a guy called Charles Barry uh, to illustrate his book. And one or two copies of the book actually have photographs pasted in. Uh, they're not, they are real photographs because there was no means of reproducing them, so he kept on. He must have spent his own time uh, pasting them in. The copy that's owned by the um, uh, Woolwich, um, well it was the Woolwich Heritage Centre, God knows where it is at the moment, um, uh, actually has photographs in. I did offer to take it off their hands. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very conscious we're pushing up again to dinner, so if, if I can draw this morning's session to the conclusion. I, I think it's been, we've had two wonderful speakers who yeah. really have painted a picture of Grammar and Maudsley and their lives together and how they influenced engineering in that early period of the 18th century. Can we thank Richard in the usual way?